This is Closely Held, and you're listening to a discussion today on a new proposed rule before the Federal Trade Commission barring restrictive covenants or non-compete agreements. And I want to talk about why this is not such a good thing for a privately held business. The rule the FTC is considering would bar non-compete agreements across the board. And it bars them in a way that could bring about some very profound changes to the business climate in this country and have a direct effect on the investment of people in their own businesses. The rule's a big shift in resources, particularly for the owner of a relatively small privately held company. In essence, the non-compete ban moves the value of a company's goodwill from the owners to the business employees. If you own a business, you should have an understanding of this rule and how it might affect you. It's a major shift in resources. You can get more information about this topic and business divorce in general at my blog, www.thebusinessdivorcelawyer.com. You can also reach me with any questions that you may have through the blog. Please, if you can, take a moment to subscribe to our program, to like this content if you find it useful, and to share this podcast. Your interaction with the program really helps the channel and it helps us get information to others. The first question that you may be asking yourself is why any of this matters? If you have a private business, you're probably thinking, I don't have a lot of employees. Um, This certainly isn't a nationwide business. And although I think I have good relationships with my customers, I, I don't understand how this is possibly going to affect me. It's that relationship with customers that's the issue exact issue. This rule, if it's enacted in its present form, is going to change the ability of many businesses, big and small, to protect those customer relationships. The rule the FTC is considering is very broad. It applies not only to the traditional non-compete, but also to what the FTC describes as de facto non-competes. These are agreements like non-disclosure, confidentiality, non-solicitation agreements, and have the effect of limiting an employee from taking work with a competitor or from starting a competing business. The rule also applies to a new class of individuals as workers. These include independent contractors and sole proprietors that are contracted to work for a company, even unpaid interns. One of the first things that I would alert you to is that this rule is going to affect the value of your business. The owner's of a small business are going to see this reflected in the kinds of transactions or sales of business that they can hope to achieve. That means it's going to be harder to retire from a privately held business because it's going to be harder to sell that business. It could affect the owner's ability to borrow money. It could now require personal guarantees because the stability of the business isn't as good as it once was. The reason for all of this is that it's going to make it harder for a private business to protect what is almost invariably its most valuable asset, its goodwill. Goodwill is the the earnings power of the business. It's the reputation. It's the engine that drives value. What the broad restriction on the use of non-competes may do is make the private business less competitive. And it will discourage some businesses, I'm sure, from making investments in employees particularly when those are employee and particularly when those are at will employees, that is people who can leave at any time. Let's take a look at some of the background about what the FTC is up to. Um, The FTC is a federal agency. It's charged with the task of protecting consumers and competition by regulating and prohibiting conduct that it believes may be deceptive, unfair, or anti-competitive. It regulates a bunch of different industries and These include things like franchises, sweepstakes, games, online activities. It has, from time to time, gone after companies for what it saw as the overreaching use of non-compete agreements. The FTC's extensive comments on the rule articulates two overriding reasons why it believes that it's appropriate at this time to ban non-competes. The first is a list of cases that large public companies have pursued in recent years, and frankly, they're pretty wildly overreaching. They involve relatively low-wage employees without any access to the kinds of information and influence that have long been the rationale behind most non-compete contracts and non-compete laws. The cases included such things as warehouse workers and security guards. These contracts, 
identified by the FCC on their face screamed that they were being devised by large companies to make rank and file workers less mobile and to avoid having to compete for talent based on wages. The second rationale, and the one that the FTC really focuses on, is the negative effect that restrictive covenants are claimed to have on the earnings of American workers and professionals. The agency's analysis of the proposed rule spends a great deal of time reviewing the way in which non-compete agreements result in lower wages across a broad spectrum of employees and professionals. These studies, the commission says, reduce wages by reducing competition. And the FTC estimates that its proposed rule banning non-competes would increase American workers' income by $250 to $269 billion a year. The commission cites a bunch of different studies and notes that as many as one in five of us work under some form of non-compete and that one in three have been subject to a non-compete at some point in the past. Wages are depressed, according to these studies, by 3 to 14 percent. Is the FTC ban on non-competes part of an emerging trend in the U.S. economy? Certainly, there have been a number of statutory limitations that have been adopted by various states, as well as the fact that non-competes are subject to close judicial oversight. So far, however, only California, North Dakota, and Oklahoma have banned non-competes in the same way as the proposed rule by the FTC. Eleven states have banned non-competes with low-wage workers by placing an income requirement on the enforceability of a non-compete agreement. And some states have enacted other statutory restrictions. These include such things as a prohibition on courts blue-penciling or amending a restrictive covenant to make it reasonable. The idea is that if you you can't blue-pencil it, you have to knock it out, and that's going to force companies to be more reasonable when it drafts a non-compete. But the truth is that in all of the states where non-competes are still permitted, the restrictions on employment are subject to pretty intensive judicial scrutiny. And there is a commonly adopted reasonableness standard. There are three elements to this reasonableness standard, and let's just take a quick review of those. First of all, it's generally accepted that in all the states where restrictive covenants are are permitted, that the non-compete has to protect a legitimate interest of the employer. The second thing, it has to be reasonable as to scope, that's the geographic scope, and reasonable as to duration, that's the time that it's there. So courts that are balancing the interest of the business against the interest of employers and being able to pursue their living are going to constantly be balancing these reasonableness elements in order to come up with something that the court thinks is a is a reasonable application of and what the courts think is a reasonable application of a contract that protects the interests of the business but doesn't unduly burden the employee with not being able to work. So let's take a look at what the text of the rule looks like. So the rule it's itself is is not particularly long, but it's interesting for what it the way it handles some of these broad definitions. First, it applies to any business entity, such as a partnership, a corporation, limited liability, or other legal entity or or a division of it. Um, It defines non-compete clause to mean a contractual term between an employee and a worker that prevents the worker from accepting, from seeking or accepting employment with a person operating a business after the conclusion of the worker's employment with the with the uh, employer, so it it has a a broad definition of who it applies to and what's a non compete clause. But even beyond that, the the rule has a clause in it that identifies what it calls a functional test for whether a you know, a particular agreement is a non complete clause. So you you can have other kinds of agreements that related to post-employment restrictions, things like non-solicitation agreements, confidentiality agreements. What the what the rule does is it, it says we have to take a look at these and see whether there is a de facto non-complete. And it says it says in the rule that there is a functional test um, is whether it has the effect of prohibiting the worker from seeking or accepting employment with a person. You know, with the business after the conclusion of the worker's employment with the employer. So you, you have this issue now in which it's not just things that on their face say non-compete, but it's also things that could have the effect of limiting the ability of a former employer from finding work afterwards. The FTC's rule now makes it an unfair method of competition for the employer to either enter into a non-compete clause with the worker, 
to maintain with a worker a non-compete clause or to represent to the worker that the worker is subject to a non-compete clause. It applies to employees, contractors, interns, and volunteers uh, all alike. Now, one of the interesting things about this, and I, which I think is a particular import to people who own private businesses, is the way that it deals with the exception for sales of businesses. The requirements of the rule shall not apply to a non-compete clause that is entered into by a person who is selling a business entity or by a person who is selling all or substantially all of a business entity's operating assets. Now that really reflects what is a, a, the general rule, which is that when you buy or sell goodwill, when you sell a business, you can always sell with it an agreement that you won't compete with the business that you just sold. And, and that really makes a lot of sense. No one's going to buy a business and have the seller then turn around and go into competition with them. By and large, although it's not a blanket rule, but by and large, courts do enforce non-competes that are given in conjunction with the sale of equity, the sale of a business. And that the concept behind it is that you're buying or selling the goodwill itself, that that's part of the transaction. Here's where it changes significantly, which is that there is this other language here that says that when the person restricted by the non-compete clause is a substantial owner of or substantial member or substantial partner in the business entity at the time the person enters into the non-compete clause. And I would suggest to you that that's a problem. It's a problem because it, substantial owner is defined as somebody who owns 25%. Now, not everybody who can harm a business by leaving and competing in a way that's really unfair to the owner of the business is going to own 25%. You have businesses with 10 partners, each own 10% or you have people who own less than 25%. And the damage that somebody can do is not limited to the people who, who own the 25, meet the 25% threshold. What does this mean? A lot. First, smaller companies are much more vulnerable to resignations of employees with competitive information or that have a competitive advantage. The FTC's commentary states that the rule would not bar confidentiality agreements, non-disclosure agreements, non-solicitation agreements, but you have to measure that against its de facto non-compete language. If the otherwise permitted agreement, such as a non-solicitation agreement, would effectively bar an employee from post-employment competition, it's likely under the rule that it would function as a de facto non-compete. And unlike with much larger companies, the risk to a small company that's presented by the resignation of a key employee, it's proportionately larger. Big public companies are not going to be nearly as impacted by the resignation of one or several people. They're going to be able to weather the financial consequences of a defector. A private business is going to be less likely to weather that kind of change, that kind of competition that may come up. Private businesses also make proportionately bigger investment in their key employers, and they expose them frequently to more of the critical information about the business, and they're more likely to allow a single person to have a much bigger impact on the business than they would with a large business. It's hard to imagine, for example, that Amazon or Microsoft would be ruined by an employee defection to a competitor. But it's not so hard to imagine, however, that the local real estate management company can really be put under financial stress by the defection of a key executive to a competitor. In a similar way, the smaller business is much more likely to rely on a limited customer base. Large public entities can have millions of customers. A closely held business may rely on just a handful. Here again, the relative harm to the business is disproportionately weighted when you're considering a private business as opposed to a large public business. Banning restrictive covenants is going to transfer value from the company to its employee. It's a recognized principle of business valuation that goodwill, that is the reputation of a business and its ability to generate new business from that reputation, doesn't belong to a company unless it's been transferred to the company. And the vehicle for that transfer is a non-compete agreement. It's recognized when the IRS, for example, values a privately held business and also recognized in many states that goodwill, the ability to sell, the reputation that generates the business does not belong to the business unless and until there's been a transfer. 
The result is that when applying traditional valuation rules to a company, rules that rely very frequently in large part on the value of the goodwill, and that includes most service businesses, it's going to be worth not much more than the value of its bank accounts and its hard assets once you back that goodwill out. This may not be such a big deal for the manufacturing business, but for the consulting firm, for the advertising agency, and for a host of other service businesses, it is a huge shifting of resources from the business to its employee. A transfer that is going to happen without any compensation to the employer company. In a similar vein, the substantial partner definition restricts the ability of a company to provide a full array of incentive compensation. What the rule means is that owners who leave, unless they are a 25% owner, cannot be limited in their subsequent employee. And this proposal is contrary to what has become a pretty uniform presumption that the goodwill that's sold as part of a transfer of equity can be protected with a non-compete agreement. And many businesses have owners with less than 25% interests. And it's generally accepted that restrictive covenants as part of the purchase or sale of those owner's interests will be enforceable. Consider what the effect might be on someone who wants to retire, who has less than 25% of a business. Under this rule, the FTC rule, the company that wants to repurchase that interest can't ask the seller for a restrictive covenant or a non-compete that is. And the corollary of that is that the retiring owner can't sell the non-compete to the business. The risk of competition from this ex-employee who's retired but could just turn around and start a new business in competition is going to be a lower payout for the purchase of that interest. Or let's think about the relatively frequent case of the oppressed minority shareholder. These cases involve someone who has been oppressed by the majority, and they're very commonly resolved with some kind of a compelled purchase of the minority shares. Those transactions in which the minority share is purchased, whether they're ordered by a court or negotiated by the parties, could run afoul of the FTC rule if the minority that's involved in the case owns less than 25%. The FTC is asking for comments on the rule, and I've attached a copy of the notice and the request for comments to this post. The rulemaking process typically takes quite a number of months, and Congress can override the rule. And ultimately, a rule such as this is something that's likely to end up in the courts. It's not going to happen right away. But the owners of privately held businesses should be aware of this development. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, to like this podcast, and to share it with anyone you think might be interested. Don't forget you can get more information about business divorce and the topics related to business divorce, like restrictive covenants, at my blog, www.thebusinessdivorcelawyer.com. Once again, thanks for listening.